There's only one inevitability in the world of subtractive machining. Scrap. Whether it's chips, offcuts, or Friday afternoon fandangles, there's no avoiding the steady march of material from the rack, to the bucket, to the scrap. Except, what if there is? Now, unless you're trying to cast mercury, you'll need a little more heat than a standard domestic oven can provide. Unfortunately, my request to have a vacuum arc furnace installed was met with an unequivocal no from my landlord, so I just had to go for the cheapest alternative I could find, which should at least let us melt some aluminium. Of course, cheap is fairly relative. For the amount I spent on equipment, refractories and consumables, I probably could have bought a pretty good chunk of freshly baked stock material. But let's not pretend the economics of hobby machining have ever held up to scrutiny. Kind of like these tongs that came in the kit. Before we do any actual casting, the furnace that I got came with these tongs. They just don't seem quite up to snuff. We're gonna have to make our own. Now, I have forged tongs before, but my arms got really tired. So this time I took the fabricator's approach. It's common knowledge that the number of holes in your welding bench directly correlates to the size of your fabrication abilities. So it might surprise you to learn that even with the overabundance of holes in my new bench, I still experience more than one episode of don't measure and cut three times. God damn it. Beautiful. But with a little perseverance, it wasn't long before I reached a point of fit for purposeness, perfectly sufficient for the task at hand. All right. Once roughly the same could be said for the pouring handle, it was time to start thinking about what I'd be pouring the molten metal into. Green sand is an interesting name for an otherwise fairly uninteresting mix. The main ingredient's sand, which is a solid 9 out of 10 at not catching fire. And there's a sprinkle of powdered bentonite clay and a squirt of water to help it keep its shape. Now, after a lot of searching, I did manage to find a powdered bentonite supplier, only 733 kilometers away. But it's easy enough to make your own. All you need is some kitty litter. Oh, that was so clever. It's cracked in multiple places. We might have to stick it in a bucket. Uh, good thing I got a bucket. A brick and a paving stone. Well, this sucks. All you need is some kitty litter, a food processor. I think it's kind of working. And a sieve. No. I feel like a madman. <laughs> I probably look like one. Yeah, I was gonna say, I won't tell you how you look. All you need is some kitty litter and someone you can trick into enjoying the process. We need to tilt it. I don't hate this though. That's the funny thing. Like exactly. I'm kind of enjoying it. <laughs> how much? Do you want me to pour the whole thing? Like maybe cover that and then I'll mix it. Yep, quite simple really. As long as you've got a food processor and a bucket and some sand. And some kitty litter. And a furnace and a sieve. Oh, we still haven't made the flasks yet either. So on the list of one million things you need before you can melt metal and turn it into something that isn't melted metal. Molten metal? We need a flask, which is a vessel for the sand to go in. And then we can, anyway, you'll see. It's not rocket science. Some plywood offcuts form the basis of a flask, which will need to keep the sand in one piece once it's packed around our pattern and ready to be flipped. Usually you'd find these in pairs, but to maximize the probability of a first time success, I opted for an open top mold, a pattern with plenty of extra meat and a healthy amount of post pour machining. Oh, and speaking of patterns. What are you doing? Thanks. Just uh, using on shape to model up that pulley blank. I've got to admit, Designing this pattern in Onshape feels a bit like fetching a carton of milk in a Lamborghini. See, Onshape has everything you'd expect in a CAD package, including parametric design, simulation, and rendering capabilities, giving you the tools you need to design anything, from the simplest of tapered cylinders, all the way up to a state-of-the-art hypercar. Oh, and did I mention it's built entirely in the cloud? Onshape runs in a web browser, 
which means you can use it basically anywhere, on pretty much any device. If you've ever designed anything, you already know the truth. Iteration isn't optional. The first attempt teaches you what not to do. Doesn't fit. And the second only confirms it, which is exactly why Onshape's Git style version history is so powerful. Every change is captured in real time, giving you the freedom to explore, revise, branch off, and collaborate from anywhere. So, whether you're designing a simple cylinder or a hypercar, click the link in the description to try Onshape Professional, free for up to six months. Placing the printed pattern on a paver in the centre of my flask, I began packing the void with green sand. I don't think we can expect anything but lessons. It didn't take long to realise I'd been a little too generous with the size of the flask. I, I didn't get enough sand. <laughs> But some more scrap timber helped to preempt any kind of blowouts while flipping the whole thing. And then I could remove the pattern with a little percussive persuasion. All right. Cutting in a pouring channel would certainly have been easier with the pattern still in place. But with such a simple design, it was easy enough to press it back in place to tidy things up. Let's get hot. Now, I know I said we'd be doing aluminium chips, but I haven't really been doing much machining lately, so I haven't got a whole lot of chips. What I do have is shitloads of offcuts. I just need to dry out the crucible and dry out the aluminium. And then hopefully we can melt some of it. Fingers crossed, anyway. And once I was sure the crucible and donor material were completely free of moisture, it was time to fire up the furnace. You know, for my first ever pour, things went incredibly well. Wow, you got exactly the perfect amount. Look at that. That went pretty well, didn't it? Looks a bit like a <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? Look, I said balloon, <laughs> but yeah. uh, did anyone say how long it takes to? No, no, because usually it just cuts straight to pulling the thing out. <laughs> At least until I decided it was time to demold. Oh, too soon, you fucking idiot. <laughs> Damn. I thought it might be a bit hot down the bottom. You're way cleverer than I am. You can melt it down again, right? Yeah. That's the beauty of it. And you also- should have walked away. You should have made me walk away. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But it wasn't all bad news. 
It looks good. Like there's no inclusions or anything. Some closer inspection of the casting revealed some very promising results. And remedying the failure would just be a matter of melting it down a second time. So the next day I repacked my mold, remelted my metal, and re-poured my part. And with hindsight on my side. Now we just leave it. And a sufficient amount of cooling considered. It's been a couple of hours. Let's have a look at this thing. Ho ho! I'd finally managed to conjure up a proper casting. Bloody perfect. But the proof of the pudding is in the machining. So now, all we have to do is machine away everything that isn't our pulley. Machining through the crust of our muffin revealed some porosity. There's a few voids in there likely caused by the second melting and the resultant extended exposure to our nitrogen-rich atmosphere. But in the absence of any rotationally induced rapid disassembly, I'll go ahead and put these blemishes in the category of aesthetic, comma, minor. That looks heaps good. And move right along. Now, this video isn't really about cutting pulleys, but one thing you should know is the diameter is pretty important. So I'd been very pleased to hit my target right on the nose. 78.43, baby. All right, let's see how he did. Except I didn't. Doesn't fit. Instead falling victim to the old five millimeter trick. Luckily on this occasion, those misplaced millimetres were outside my part. Thankfully, it's five millimetres oversized and not five millimetres undersized. So I just have to wipe them off and have another go. There we go. That's actually 78.43. The other thing I realised when I had already mounted this thing on the milling machine is that I really don't have a way to indicate it once the teeth are cut in. So I'm also going to turn a bit of a counter bore on this face. Also ruined any chance I had of mounting this thing directly on the encoder. So loose. So I think I'll bore that out to a size where I can shrink fit a shaft into the center. In the spirit of doing things right the second time, I gave extra care and attention to dialing in my blank. Yeah. Let's do it all again before handing things over to my gear cutting macro to take the first of several passes at all 50 of its intended teeth. The third of several passes reached final depth and the moment of truth had arrived.
Now, I'm well aware that this pulley could have just as easily been made from a piece of round bar, but not everything is a cylinder in a vacuum, and I'm sure that someday, just a little bit of metal melting will make for a whole lot less mucking around. Dang. I mean, I knew it was going to need a flange, but for some reason, I hoped it wouldn't. 